All right. Hello. Technically the second per Craig Shurston in the entire world. Um, yes, I'm Craig. I suppose I should actually bring up my talk for myself so I can see it too. Is it? Oh, now I brought up the Windows thing. I'm really good at this. Okay. I think. There we go. Okay, so I'm Craig. I'm a student at Patrick's, and I'm going to talk today about some work that I did while I was an intern at Kojitai last summer. Kojitai is an AI company. They look at basically solving AI, solving general AI and how you can do that in a continual learning setting, robots that continually construct their world, models of their world, and learn how to interact in it. Uh, it started by Mark Ring, Peter Stone, and Satinder Singh. And this work was with my colleague there, James McGlashan, and with my supervisor, Patrick Polarski. So this is Gamonets, Generalizing Value Estimation Over Time Scale. Uh, this is accepted as a workshop paper for PGM. RL, I think is what it's called, the workshop at ICML this year. And so it's somewhat preliminary. So let's set the reinforcement learning uh, environment here. So we've got an agent, it's in the world, uh, it observes the world, and we'll call that ST, the state of the world ST. It takes an action, A, T, according to some policy pi of ST. The environment changes to the, some new state as in reaction uh, with some probability. And we get the, the agent gets a reward. And the agent's job is to figure out how it can learn best to behave in the world to get the most reward. And it does this with these reward and punishment signals. So the agent wants to maximize the amount of reward it gets off in the future. And we call that sum of future rewards the return. And this return is discounted by this thing called gamma. Here, oh, you can, I'll use this then. Gamma, can anyone see that? Is it visible? OK, so we've got gamma there. That gamma is the focus of this talk today. And what he does is say how important the future uh, rewards are. So if gamma is 0, the only reward we really care about is the next one. If gamma is 1, we care about all rewards equally. And one of the ways that the agent can learn to how to make good decisions is by taking something called the value estimate. And the value is the expectation of the return from some state S. If we have these value estimates, then we can, uh, we have this loss function, this given by delta, the TD loss, and that's given as our current reward plus this discount of the value of our next state that we observe. Okay, and that TD error is gonna be important in the next bit here. So general value functions take these value functions and instead of looking at reward, they look at some other signals that we have available to the agent. There are three elements to general value function. Policy pi, prediction target, which we'll call cumulant C, which replaces the R that we saw on the previous slide, um, and then this time scale gamma. For those of you with a background in GVFs already, we're gonna look just at fixed gammas for the rest of the talk. We're not gonna look at state dependent or transition dependent gammas. So one of the ideas with GVFs is that we, should, we could use them to model the world as a collection of predictive questions. Questions like, if I drive forward, how much current will my motors draw over the next three seconds? So if you, uh, one of the claims is that if we ha can construct these hierarchically, we can begin to model more and more abstract concepts and get more and more complex behaviors. And the nice thing about these is that they're grounded in the agent's own experience. So as I was saying, one of the ways we want to use these GVFs is as state information, as a representation of our world, and we can learn a policy with respect to that. Now you can imagine um, that being able to pr predict something at many time scales might be very, fairly useful. In this, in this scenario, we've got this car, you're driving a car, predicting a collision at, at various time scales is, is important in different ways in these two pictures here. And you might want to predict, in the first one you might want to care more about far in the future, whereas if you're in this one on the right, you might care more about the short term. And this might depend on the conditions, the weather conditions, how fast you're driving, how much traffic there is, all, all sorts of things. So, 
And the idea is if, I'm going to argue that if we have predictions at many different time scales, that this just provides a more robust representation of state that the agent can then learn a better policy from. So the main thing we're going to do in this talk is to have a function approximator, which is going to be able to make value estimates for any target gamma. And so what we're using a single network. And what we're going to do is to treat the time scale uh, as one of the inputs to our estimator. So instead of just V of S, now we have V of S and gamma. This gives us uh, a new bootstrap target for any time scale we want, any fixed time scale at any, time, at any given time step. We can, uh, we can compute this TD error. And because we have this, we can make an algorithm that goes something like this. Just for a moment longer. You bet. That's our target gamma. So we've picked some arbitrary gamma that we want to look at. Does that mean gamma times t? No, sorry, that's gamma sub subscript t. So you have some way of mapping from capital T to gamma. T here is target. The big key, big T is target. Gamma, this is my target gamma. The agent decides that, or you, it's not just the agent, decides I want three minutes here and 10 minutes there and 10 seconds here. The algorithm, uh, as I'll show you, it'll, it's going to pick. It's going to pick. Yeah, yeah. What is T? It's not, is it? Like Little T is time. Big T is target. <laughs> uh, an arbitrary, you, you've picked some t that you want to compute, some uh, gamma t. Maybe it should be delta t gamma t rather than uh, big T. Um, but you've arbitrarily picked some gamma that you want to evaluate computed TD error for. And that's, that's gamma t in this. Could you like subscript it like j or i or something? Like it, one of any number Other than t. <laughs> <laughs> Get rid of the capital t and just have gamma. I could. Yes, so yes. Like multiple little t's, no, 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 but, but for a single little t, you could imagine having from three minutes or five minutes or ten minutes. You That's could right. Imagine having a capital T. And what we're going to do is we're actually on every time set, we're going to have more than one gamma that we're going to compute. We're going to compute more than one TDR. Right. More than one target gamma, so target no TDR. Yeah, <laughs> no longer T. <laughs> Uh, okay, so on each transition, we're going to get this tuple. We're going to move from state S, we're going to take an action, and then we're going to move to S prime, and we're going to get some cumulant that we're interested in predicting. And then on each time set, we're going to have some function that's going to select uh, a, a, a set of gammas or a set of time scales on that time step. And for each of those gamma t's, okay. We're going to run our network forward twice. It's a single network, but we have to run it forward twice, so that's how I had to draw it. Um, and we get this V of S and V of S prime. So gamma, the cap of gamma t could be gamma one minute, and the second one could be gamma t be gamma Sure. Minutes. Yep. So different t's. Yes, yes. Okay. Selecting out of there. OK, and then and this, so what we end up getting is for each gamma that we've got in our set, we're going to compute a TD error. Okay. And then we're going to take those TD errors back and update the parameters of our network. It's good? But you have one net network. There's just one network. Yes, there's one network. I'm running it twice to get my TD error for each, each one. So yeah. Is there one update for each state like in this, in this situation? So I mean, you could run each of these in a loop. Of course, you could take compute each TD. Is this what you're asking? You could compute each TD error and then run it in a loop and update your parameters. Or you can just collect them and run them all yeah, at once. Like multiple gammas in every step, and then you update with multiple gammas for one state? Yes, yes. So on each time step for each tuple that we have, we're going to compute, for mul we're going to compute multiple TD errors for the multiple gammas and update that. So initially, you said that you'd be using these estimates to construct a state representation. Mm. So what is that state, the one you already have? So the, uh, yeah, so I mean, 
imagine some big network, and it, where are you going to draw? You can draw a line at any point in that network, at any layer, and say, well, that's my S. That's what's coming in, or that's, uh, that's what's going out. Um, so S, calling it state is maybe a bit of a mislabel. Call it input. There's some input vector x of, of time t and x of t plus 1 coming in there. right? And then so we can imagine that on the output when we make predictions like these Vs, we can call that you know, state to whatever our policy is going to learn. Does that make sense? Somewhat. Okay. Well, that's what you call, I mean, it if It seems like a chicken and egg problem. You already have a state and then you want to learn. You never have state. Learn. State is, I hate the word state, <laughs> but that's what everybody uses. Okay. Uh, <laughs> It is a lie. One important thing is there's not a loop back, right? The predictions are not being fed into this part. No, not in, in what I've drawn here, no. I haven't looked at that at all. Okay. What happens next? What's that? What happens next? Okay. <laughs> okay, so let's talk. <laughs> Practically, there's some considerations when we run this. Um, so I'm going to introduce this term tau. And tau is going to be the expected time steps determination. It's another way of looking at the time scale. It's another way of looking at gamma, and it's got this relationship here. And why this is important is that gamma, if you look in gamma here, and we look at these like kind of upper time scales, say, you know, like uh, these are really compressed. So if you were trying to discretize across gamma and these even discretizations, you don't have good resolution up here at the, at the higher time scales. Okay? And if you flip it on its head, tau doesn't have good resolution in, in the shorter time scales. Okay? And this will be important uh, when we try to run this thing. And so this affects how we featureize. How we pass that into our network is going to affect, uh, affect things. And it's also going to affect how we sample this set of gammas that we want to want to train on. Further, different magnet or different uh, prediction time scales have different magnitude of returns. So long, t you know, long term predictions can have very big returns and short term ones might have very small. And what we don't want necessarily is for these long predictions to, to dominate the parameters of our network. And so what I'm going to do in the experiment here is I'm going to prescale the cumulants by one minus gamma to kind of put them all in the same playing field. So as I said, this is fairly pre preliminary. So the only experimental results I have are in a very simple square wave. It's 100 time steps in length. Uh, for inputs to our network, we're going to take the time step in the square wave, so between 0 and 99, and then it repeats. And then we're going to uh, input the time scale in some way. Now we're going to normalize those inputs and tau code it. And tau coding is just kind of a way of discretizing those inputs. And then I'm going to end up applying linear function approximation on top of that. Okay? For selecting the time scales for training, I'm going to arbitrarily pick six of them that we're going to train on, and I'm going to bracket it. I'm always going to train on tau equals one and always tau equals 100 time steps. So let's kind of set the, the range of time scales that I'm interested in. In between that, I'm going to select four time scales, um, and I'm using a beta distribution so on, with support on one to 100 time steps. And this gives a distribution something like this. And this is somewhat arbitrary, but I made these choices so that we would have a fair bit of, of training going on at these longer time scales to deal with a bit of that discretization problem there, uh, but still providing a good chunk of, of good number of training samples on lower valued um, ones. And this is just details of this experiment. I'm not suggesting that this is the right distribution to use for training. I'm seeing funny expressions. <laughs> okay. Beta one four. Yeah. I just plugged those uh, parameters into the beta distribution function scipy, and that's what I got. So. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll take your word for that. I'd have to look up the details of that. So this is also skewed. This is also skewed by the brackets too. Oh. The, they're included in this distribution. So getting that those modes on the on the two sides is, is part of that uh, bracketing. Because it should very low chance of zero or one. 
Yeah, yeah. Okay. And here's some results. We trained for 50,000 time steps, and this is what we get. Uh, so the ideal predictions. What does that mean? What does this diagram mean? What is this? I was just going to explain it. Oh, the previous one. I would say just don't worry about it, honestly. <laughs> this, is, I this is a distribution of gammas that I trained on for this next sl slide. So distribution over gamma. You say you sampled four of them. Yeah, so, okay, on each time step, there are six time scales I'm using. Two of them are given by the, this bracketing that I'm always training on tau equals one time step and on tau equals 100 time steps. Then the additional four time scales that I train on at each time step are sampled from this beta distribution given by alpha equals one and beta equals four. But this is not tau you're showing. Right, but we have this relationship between tau and gamma. We can we can we can express it in either either form. Okay. Okay. So, what does the graph on the right mean? Okay, this is the distribution of of time scales expressed in gamma that I used for training. So there's a lot at 100, there's a lot at gamma equals zero, and then there's a smattering in between. There's a little bit at 0.5, which would be two time steps. So Craig, maybe this, maybe this will help. Yep. This is over an entire episode. You're sampling, you're sampling every time step, four of those. And now what you're doing is adding those up across the entire experiment. Yes. And that's the histogram of the ads across your entire experiment. Yes, so yes, yes, yes. Yes, but including those brackets. Including the brackets. So it's the six over the six. Okay. Yep. Yes. Yeah, for every every time step, I'm updating with six gammas that I've drawn. And then it, this is constant. Like, so it, it's always like six updates at every. Time. Yes, but a different six, other than those brackets, which I continually apply. Yeah. So, I mean, the stability proofs and coverage proofs will all carry over because the distribution of the update distribution. Okay, I'll have to take your word for that one. I'd have to think about that one. So we have a square wave. We've predicted it that the square wave is given in this light blue in there. The ideal predictions for each of the time scales is given by this dashed line. And then our solid lines are the actual predictions. We can see that these bracketed values that got trained on every single time step, they do really well. The orange is the one time step. The, blue, the light blue here is this 100 time step. We do kind of OK in some of these other immediate, intermediate ones. Uh, yellow and, and gray don't do that well. That could be part of how I've drawn those, those gammas for training. This is really proof of concept, more than you know, saying that this is the best way to do it. These are testing lines, correct? Yes. So these are not the ones you trained on. These are not the ones no. you trained on. These are time scales that you're testing on. Just, That's you right. may never have seen during training. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 So your input is, is gamma. It's time scale, so represented, uh, and I'm going to get into. It. We're going to actually look at different ways to represent that. But in, this, in these results, mm -hmm. is, is the input tau or is the input gamma? Sometimes it's it's one or the other. I'm I'm going to show a slide where we look at the difference between presenting gamma or t gamma or tau wow. as input and how that affects performance. Do you want to tell us what this is? <laughs> Uh, this one was given with gamma and tau. Yep. Okay, so we'll get right into that. So as I said, there's some, some uh, high nonlinearities with uh, gamma and how it relates to time scale, or to time steps. And so you, you can imagine that these might do better or worse at different, uh, at different time scales. Okay, so what I've done here is that I've taken, uh, these are some test, uh, test time scales that I'm going to evaluate. I've run the predictions forward. I've taken the squared error at, at these predictions. And then what I've done is that I've normalized that error by one minus gamma 
and squared that. And why do I do that? Is so that it's not just the long-term time scale predictions that are dominating this graph. So I'm saying all of the predictions at all the time scales that I'm evaluating are weighted equally. Okay? To try and make it fair. Um, okay, and then we've summed ac across all of them. And what we see is that when I represent tau, that didn't do so well. When I represented uh, the input as gamma, did a bit better. And then when I represent it both, that does the best still. So, so why would we want to do that? We'd expect that you know, tau would give better representation for longer time scales. Gamma would give better representation for shorter time scales. Just more informative. Yeah? So what, what is the x-axis you're That's time steps. So this is over time. This is running over 50,000 time steps through our experience. So this would be like a learning rate that we're getting. Yeah. And there's 90, these, uh, the shading is 95% confidence intervals on there. No, it's just really light on this projector. Uh, it's about that big. So it's not really statistically, you know, yeah. Note to self, make them darker. Uh, okay, so then we're going to look at, I've talked also about the need to prescale. Yet, yeah, Rich? Well, so did you run this many times? Yes. Yes, this was 40 times, I think. Yeah, and what was randomized was the, uh, the tile coding on that. So different seeds used for, for how the, the tile coding is randomized. So it was the uh, kind of tile coding with random offsets. Well, random offsets? Yeah. Yes, yes, that was also randomized, yes. Okay, so I also mentioned that we don't want, you know, the, that these longer term returns can dominate the parameters of the network because uh, the returns are bigger. And so we look here also at the effect of... of, took care of that. The returns aren't bigger. We're doing that right now. We're comparing those two things. So we've taken our, our best input from the previous one, which was to provide gamma and tau as input. And now if we don't prescale, we have this blue line. If we do prescale, we end up with lower error. And that does not mean that we get lower error for all predictions, but the sum total of across all of our tests are, is lower in this case. And we also look quickly at the effect of our gamma selection function. Um, so the blue line indicates that rather than using that beta distribution, what we're doing is just uniformly sampli sampling over gamma. So between 0 and 1. Didn't do so hot. Uh, as, and then we, for this orange, we're uniformly sampling across tau. So again, across a different scale, we'd expect better representation for higher time scales, better, more sampling at higher rate frequencies. Um, did a bit better. And then we, we do this trick that we're going to combine them. It worked on our input, so let's try sampling across using that for our gamma selection function. Again, we have the brackets. We're going to sample two from a uniform distribution on gamma and two from a uniform distribution on tau did better. Um, but it turns out the arbitrary beta function I happened to select did, uh, did better than all of those. Okay, I'm not going to go into super detail on this one. All I'm going to say from this is that these, these considerations about how you represent time scale on the input and how you select gamma and these prescalings they all kind of affect the, the performance of the network in different ways uh, and at different time scales. And some, some put more, do better at higher time scales and some do better at lower. And some are kind of a best of both worlds kind of, or, or you know, try to do well-ish on both of them. And that was kind of hidden in some of the previous ones where we kind of tried to give, uh, just, just take the sum over all of those things. Yep. In your top coding. Yep. Yeah, so the time index along the square wave yeah. and the effect of gamma. That's right. So there was taken, a, if, if there was just uh, the time steps and, say, gamma, then it was a 2D tau coding. If I had uh, time steps, gamma, and tau, then it was, it was three-dimensional tau coding. It was conjunctive, as you say. Yeah, Matt? Oh, sorry. Conjunctively, 
gamma and tau, I mean, they're correlated. They don't take on all any all values. Right. So, so most of your tau's would never exist. Yeah, I didn't look at the coverage to see. Depending on how wide they look. Right, and I used varying, varying uh, coarseness. Matt? No? Okay. All right, so we're almost wrapping up here. Using gamma nets. Uh, I feel like basically what I've got right now is a solution looking for a problem. Um, I've managed to convince myself at least twice that this is a terrible idea and I should abandon all future work. And then somebody keeps saying, oh, this is really neat. <laughs> and I look at it again. I just got an email from Hado today saying, oh, this is really neat. You should check out this related paper. And it's <laughs> Yeah, probably. Um, so I have said that, you know, in the predictive representation of state kind of sense that we, you know, maybe this would be useful. Uh, that was kind of my original motivation. But it's not clear to me that this would be better to do, have this arbitrary gamma values than simply picking a handful of gamma values at the beginning, having very explicit predictors for those, and then having your policy learner take that in. And that network can decide exactly what it wants to do with that. Not clear to me that that would be better. Um, further, it doesn't fit into a lot of our normal, the way we do a lot of our normal learning frameworks right now. So instead of a single pass through our, our network here, you would have to select how many gammas you were going to ask questions about, you're going to select which gammas you're going to ask questions about, and then you would have to run the network forward that many times, stack up your output, and, and put it into your policy network. So it's a little weird that way. Okay? Uh, maybe it would work well as auxiliary tasks for representation learning. Um, that one I'm quite interested in. But if, if you're not familiar with that, there was a paper a while back for, out of DeepMind where they had uh, Unreal, and then it, which is what they called their, their algorithm. And they had their policy learner, they had their value learner, but then they also had a bunch of other tasks that they were learning on top of that, things they were predicting in their environment, other loss functions. And basically they got faster learning and better performance. And so that might, this might be useful as a loss function for that. What about learning t policies with with respect to different time scales. So, you know, if, you're, if you have a robot and you're trying to get it to learn something, we often tweak this gamma knob to try and get it to learn the thing we want. We watch, set a gamma, we watch it go, and it, eh, it didn't quite do what I want. Maybe we'll tweak the reward function. Maybe we'll tweak gamma a little bit and see if it actually learns what I wanted it to learn. Um, really, you want gamma to, to be long, to be, to, to be you, you know, you want to maximize the total reward you get. But long rewards are, are there's big variance in the returns on those kind of things. And they're, they're arguably, I expect, harder to learn. So maybe what we want to do is to start out learning policies with respect to very short time scales. And then as those kind of are learned, we move to longer and longer ones. So maybe that's an application we could look at here. And then, of course, there's the whole trans transition dependent uh, discounting that, that we use in the general value function literature, where gamma is not a fixed value, now it's a function of our transition. And that seems like a really obvious next step to, to take this to. All right, so in summary, I've shown a way that we could generalize value estimation across time scale. And we did this by treating the time scale that we're interested in as an input parameter and uh, training over many time scales on each time step. I also point out that there was this nonlinear relationship between gamma and tau that we have to consider and how we, how we uh, provide that time scale as input to this network uh, has an impact and also impacts how we train, we select those gammas for training. And we have to keep in mind the magnitudes of our updates uh, with respect to the time scales. So I'm gonna leave you with the big algorithm. You can look at it or not, and I'll take any more questions if there are any. Yo. Well, I'd say TD0, can you use lambda or not? No, I didn't use lambda in this one. This is just TD0. Can you use lambda though? Sure, why not? I'd have to think, you know what, I'd have to think about that a bit, bit more. That was a bit flippant, but.
Yes, you could actually. <laughs> you just. That's quick for us. Because I did actually think about this at one point. It just took me a moment to recall. I I have the code written. I just haven't like actually run it, or I haven't optimized anything for it. Uh, preliminary, the one time I ran it, it didn't seem to matter if I had the inputs as gamma or tau, because maybe the network just handles the problems with the discretization there. Yeah, Roshan. Okay. So uh, you can actually just take offline computer set of weights um, so that you can recover all of the camera returns uh, just without any training in the world, right? Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Another uh, sort of comment is that like, gamma is one way of specifying time scales, right? <laughs> there's another way of specifying time scales, which is just you care about n step returns. Sure, right? yeah. Right? Yep. So you just step returns. Um, and it turns out that there's also an analytical way of recovering the expected n step returns given a set, set of gammas. So you can actually go between mm. all of these universes. So you can specify time scale in terms of gamma or n step returns. And mm. you can learn gamma returns because we have algorithms yep. for doing that. And it turns out that you can analytically go between learned gamma returns versus any other gamma return and also any other n step return. Okay. Um, so um, yeah, so I that's great, because I was just thinking about n-step returns the other day, and we couldn't figure out a right. way to do it. And the so. applications of that are really obvious, right? Because, for example, if, mm -hmm. you're, if you are thinking about, you've got two policies, and you're thinking about a policy that follows policy one for like 100 time steps, and then thereafter follows policy two. Okay. So if you knew the 100 step return for the policy one, and then the rest of the return for policy two, you could ask these sorts of questions. Mm. Would be like, what right. happens when I follow this one, you go this one, and this policy. Yeah, yeah. I guess I should. So I'm going to talk about this next month. So uh, <laughs> next time. Talk, so. Uh, yeah, on August 2nd, so during this break, um, we'll probably try to coordinate and like, work on similar experiments. Hmm. Was that a question or a thumb? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I also have another. <laughs> <laughs> Again, so like I really like what you did there with like writing the value function in mm -hmm. terms of state, but also gamma, okay. right? And uh, so you can think of that as like a space parameter, like a state where you are, mm -hmm. and then a the time parameter, right? So in general, the value function is not just a function of state, but it's a function of state and time, where the time parameter means something like, you know, how far in the future you're looking at, mm -hmm. right? And so when you think of a fun function approximated value function or whatever, that is an approximation to a true value function, right? So in the same way, you can have a true value function in space and time. And then you can think of all of these things as various approximations to that space time value function. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a really powerful way of looking at it. But also lets you answer these questions that I was talking about, like what happens when you switch policies at some point in time. Like but yeah, mm -hmm. uh, but there are applications here, I think. So. Great. <laughs> Space and time. Joseph. Uh, one comment is um, this, this idea of putting in some value function parameters as the inputs mm -hmm. has been explored a little bit through the universal value function. Yes. Yep. Um, so that's with respect to goal. Uh, maybe also time scale. Um, in the sense that the goals terminate with no, respect no, to time scale? Like, yeah, so I'm not sure. I, didn't, I didn't think so. Did, that. I'm not sure what papers are. Okay. okay. Um, uh, people have been looking at things, and so okay. Um, yeah. There it tends to be a certain smoothness in gamma, but like you can also do this with Yeah. Yeah. Um, Chen Ma just did uh, successor representation combining with the UFA, so over goals as well. So. It's one Hado sent me today. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they do do this over gamma, I think, with the okay. so okay. same idea. And yeah. That also gives an application, I guess, because they, the reason they do it is to, like, they're tuning gamma in like, their meta gradient. Yeah. So yeah. because it's changing, <laughs> excuse me, they can actually get a value function 
that's independent of that change in gamma. So even though they're changing it, they still have accurate values on it. All right, thank you for coming.